Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. So good to see you on this very beautiful, chilly Sabbath morning. God is good to us no matter what is happening outside, no matter what happens in our lives. God is always there and he cares for us. I'm reminded of this promise in 1 Thessalonians 2 uh, verses, sorry, 1 Thessalonians 3 Uh, The last part of the chapter there, starting from verse 11, it says, May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our Lord, before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And don't we look forward to the time when Jesus will come to take us to our true home, and when we will be able to say goodbye to the woes and ills and pains of this world forevermore. I wanna welcome you all again this morning, especially those who may be visiting for the very first time, as well as those who join us via our live stream. We are blessed today to have with us speaker Elder Jean Hall, uh, who's with us today. He was a pastor in Michigan Conference, So he has ministered in uh, this area, and now he serves as Michigan Conference Trust Services Associate Director. So he's with us this morning, and we look forward to the message that he has for us today. We do have a fellowship meal following second service today. All visitors and members are welcome. For those of you who may be visiting, uh, the fellowship hall is the building you see right through these windows on my left, your right. So as you exit the church, you just turn left down the corridor and then you follow your nose after that and all will be well. Uh, church board members, please make sure that you pencil in our ca- into your calendars that our regular board meeting is meeting this Monday at seven o'clock in the evening. Uh, if you would like to attend or help with the annual Thanksgiving dinner that's put on here at the church for the community. Please see the insert in your bulletin. And uh, the deadline to sign up for this is November 19. So maybe you want to stay, maybe you can't stay, but you'd like to help. Maybe you'd like to help and stay. Uh, Whatever works for you in your schedule, please refer to that insert, fill it in, and hand it in either at the information desk or slip it under the church secretary's office door. Uh, There are many more uh, bulletin uh, announcements. Please make sure you're reading them. I will just correct one announcement that is in there, the ARM, the Adventist retirees. Uh, The time that they are meeting on tomorrow, Sunday, is 11 a.m. That is actually a mistake. You will be meeting at the regular time that you usually do, which is one o'clock in the afternoon. So please make sure if anyone is confused on that to uh, make sure you tell them it is one o'clock, it's at the regular meeting time. Now we have several announcements uh, from our friends up here. So Pastor Joe, would you like to come up and share with us a little bit about El Salvador? Yes, we'd be happy to. Putting a picture, a few pictures on the screen, Pastor Ron is in El Salvador, and you may recognize the person beside him. He used to also be a pastor at the Village Church, Ariel Rodon. He's at the Oakwood Church now, and there are a couple other pastors from Michigan and other churches uh, that are joining the Village Church and um, partnering with our brothers and sisters in El Salvador and providing these churches. Where they are standing right here, this church did not exist in May. And so they are dedicating this church. These pictures were texted to me this morning from John Dronin, and um, he's down there as well. And he said in his text message that this man right here has lots of stories, but you'll have to wait till later to find out what those are. I'm not sure. Or you can just come on the mission trip and find out a whole bunch of stories for yourself. We are still taking applications for that. The Village Church is building 11 churches in El Salvador next year. And uh, John Dronin told me in his text message this morning uh, that they need our money and we need their spirit. And so this is the relational aspect of God's worldwide church. It is because in these places where we're building, um, they are very active in uh, small groups and Bible studies, but they're limited to people's front porches until these churches are, are built. They make in these locations where we're building, two to five dollars a day. So they can never dream of having what they're able to have when we partner with them without our assistance. 
So these churches here were dedicated yesterday and on Thursday, and um, the applications for the mission trip are on the, on the information desk. The deadline has been extended a week or two, and um, if you want a life-changing experience next year, make the mission trip to El Salvador part of your plans, and you will not regret it. Thank you. Elder Hall, would you like to come? Good morning. Good morning. It's a privilege to be able to be worshiping with you today. I just wanted to share a little bit of something uh, in regards to the department in the Michigan Conference that I work with, the Trust Services Department. I hope that you receive this little bulletin in your bulletin or passed to you by one of the greeters. If you didn't get one, uh, you may want to pick one up if you would like to take advantage of the services that I'm about to share with you. In the Trust Services Department, we work with our church family, our, that is you, in helping you get important legal documents. If I were to ask you to raise your hand, and I'm not asking you to, so don't raise your hand, but if I were to ask you to raise your hand, if you had a will, would you raise your hand? Actually, the truth is that all of you would be able to raise your hand because you either have your own personal will that you've made out or the state has one for you. So if you die without your own will, it's called dying intestate, they have it all worked out where your assets are gonna go. And there's a myth that the state will get everything if you don't have a will, that's not true. They'll look for your fourth cousin if they have to to try to find a way to give it all away. But there's one place that they will never give it. Do you know where that is? They'll never give it to any charity at all. So if you wanted to help build churches in El Salvador or do evangelism in Michigan or wherever else it might be, the only way to do that is to have that written in your own will. Now, when I was young, I didn't think I needed to have a will because I didn't really have any assets and it was just a matter of who was going to pay my bills when I died. That's not how wills work, really. I didn't realize that I had one of the most valuable assets that I could ever possibly have, and that, that was my children, three young children. So if you're a, a younger family and you have children, but you think you don't have any assets to worry about distributing if you died, you have a very valuable asset in your children. And if something did happen to you, who would raise them? If you don't determine that in documents, then the state will determine that. And it may not be who you choose to do that. We also help with documents called power of attorney, health care power of attorney or, or uh, power of attorney for finance. Those documents, you're able to name someone to do things for you if you were unable to. Someone that could make medical decisions if you were unconscious or who could do financial things for you if you became incapacitated. Important things to have in our uh, society today. So if you'd like help with those things, we can help you. We work with a Seventh Avenue attorney. We pay the attorney fees, so this process doesn't cost you anything, and there's no obligation to give money to the church either if you do that. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. So if you'd like help with that, there's a card on the inside uh, of this brochure. What I'd ask you to do is fill it out and put it in the offering plate, and then we'll see that uh, you get help with that. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll invite Sherry and Tony. Village Church has a really neat opportunity of something we can do for Christmas that has to do with missionaries and the unreached. And uh, Sherry Corder is here with us. She's the International Field Director Assistant and in charge of missionary care. And I'll let her explain this program to us. We've been brainstorming about what kinds of things we could do for our missionary kids this year, and in the process of that, uh, we came up with this. I was brainstorming actually with Tony. And it is that we are inviting you to fill a box with Christmas party supplies. So a Christmas party in a box. To, we will send these to our missionary kids with the idea that then the missionary kids can throw a Christmas party and invite their unreached friends to the party. At that party, the most important thing will be to tell the Christmas story to children who likely have not ever heard it before. So if you are interested in doing this, we have 
the um, a, a, a ability to send 20 of these boxes. And I'm already hearing from missionaries who are saying, yes, our kids would love to do this. And if you get kids involved, then think about this. We have kids helping kids reach kids. How cool is that? So if you have the spiritual gift of shopping, you might enjoy this particular project. <laughs> But gets people to do it with you. Now, wait a minute, isn't this going to be expensive to send all these boxes? Uh, these countries, I know how postage is. We have had a commitment from you, the Village Church, to cover the postage for this. And we feel so blessed at AFM for that commitment from the Village Church because it is very expensive to send these boxes overseas. And it could not happen without your commitment. So thank you very much for that. So that's already been covered from evangelism funds. So the only cost to you would be the stuff that goes in the box. And I have a list of things that um, you could put in here, ideas for you, um, and some things to not put in, like liquids and food and, and things like that. So do we get to wrap all these things? No. <laughs> they can't be wrapped because of how it works with sending things overseas. They can't be wrapped, and that's a big disappointment. But you can put little Christmas gift bags in there so that the kids who are distributing the gifts and things can, can put them in there. I think this is a really fun idea to help our kids learn about giving in the Christmas season. Mm -hmm. It will help the missionary kids have an opportunity to give, mm -hmm. and the children there will get to hear about Jesus coming. Um, a very fun opportunity. So where do they get the boxes? How does this work? <laughs> well, you can get them at the post office, but we have some out here. I don't know, how many of you saw that we have a Christmas tree in the lobby? Not all of you, but a lot of you did. I could not believe it. Tony and I were putting up a Christmas tree yesterday on November 9, but it was for a good cause. I don't even get my, my own Christmas tree put up by December 9. Here I was putting up a tree on November 9. But the reason is, time is of the essence. We only have one week. If you participate, you need to have these boxes back to us by next Sabbath, or there's a little grace in there to the AFM office by the following Monday. So time is of the essence, and that's why we went ahead with the tree this early in the year. So you can just stop by the tree, sign that you took a box, get the box from here, take it this week, go tomorrow, take your kids out shopping for this, or during the week sometime, and bring it back next Sabbath. Thank you. All right, we have some very exciting business to uh, take care of this morning, a family business, and I want to invite uh, Caleb and Hannah Cranover to come forward, along with uh, Brittany, our eighth grade teacher. And uh, this is because there was a couple baptisms earlier this summer as I was uh, visiting with uh, Caleb. You know, we have people in our church, uh, young people that are baptized at all different ages throughout the teen years. And, uh, but he told me it was very important to him that he had a time to think about this and that when he was baptized, um, that it was something that was really his. And um, so both these baptisms were in Wisconsin uh, this summer. And uh, today we are voting them into membership. And uh, Hannah here with us, uh, she shared with me how much of a difference some of the things in the church and the school have made and uh, the worships in the morning in eighth grade, and um, some of the meaningful things that have happened in their family's life and where they have seen God be with their family in challenging times and in uh, and all the times. And so the Cranover family is very important to us at this church and uh, in this community. And so I would entertain a motion. Well, I'd like to take them into membership today because of their baptism earlier this summer. And uh, is there a motion in a second? All right, all in favor, raise your hand. And these are raising their hands to support you and embrace you. Uh, this is very important to me because uh, as you've been baptized, you're not only baptized into Jesus, but the Bible says you're baptized into his body. And uh, this is the body of Christ. And your, your involvement and your talents and your ideas and your input is uh, very uh, valuable to us. And we look forward to many good times. And so uh, Brittany has here your hand. I'll pass it over a gift. One of these, this book is the uh, Christ Object Lessons. 
and uh, very meaningful on the parables of Christ. And if you haven't read that before, I know that that will be uh, very meaningful to you. So I'm going to ask Brittany to, to say a prayer to bless these two young people in this family uh, because of this baptism in, in their ministry and in their lives. All right, if you are a supporter of Hannah and Caleb, so that could be a friend, a family member, a church member who knows either of them, will you stand um, to show your support because they're now part of our church. So I know we have the Crown Over family here. If you guys will stand up. If we have any friends, if we have any mentors or teachers in the audience for them so they can see the support in their church, thank you so much. If you'll all bow your heads as we bless the two young people who have made this choice. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the things that you have given us, especially for the children and for the young people in our church. Lord, a church is alive with them, and they bring with them a, an, an adventuresome spirit and evangelism that we are sometimes unable to produce. And we thank you that even amidst this war, this battle on this earth that we're going through, that you are touching hearts, you're touching souls. And I praise you this morning, Lord, for Hannah and Caleb's decision. Lord, it is the number one most important decision that they will ever make in their life. And they are standing before us proud loudly proclaiming your name. Thank you, Lord, for the family that raised them, and may they bless them and continue to be a blessing to each other as they continue to hold the banner high of the things that you um, have called them to be in this dark world. We love both of these uh, children that you have given to our church, and we ask that you help us as we support them and we grow them, and as they support and grow us. We love you so much, and we cannot wait for you to take us home. In your name, amen. This time I invite you to prepare your hearts for our worship this morning and the gifts that heaven wants to give us. shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your praise, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Shall you bow your heads? Lord, come into our presence here as we worship you, as we sing praises to you and as we bring glory and honor to you. Thank you, amen. Please remain standing for our opening song, hymn number one.
be seated. Good morning. Uh, the, as I was coming the, uh, to church this morning, I was listening to WAUS, and I heard uh, the Alleluia Chorus, and I thought, what? Alleluia Chorus? It's a little early for that, isn't it? But then as I was listening to it, I was just filled with the Holy Spirit as I was, you know, thinking about worshiping God. And that's why we're here. And I think, yes, it is appropriate on the Sabbath, the Alleluia Chorus. Let's sing number 83, O Worship the King. Number 83, O Worship the King. Five hundred and seventy-three. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll go where you want me to go. Five seven three. small voice 
as we join together in getting ready for the, the Holy Spirit to come, we want to sing number 287, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. Softly and Tenderly. For the children in the audience, I see something very intriguing that you'll want to see on the front row, but you won't see it maybe unless you come up for children's story. You can begin in the back by getting the baskets to pick up the lamb's offering, and Kim Spare will have an exciting story for us right up here at the front. And while you are collecting the lamb's offering, while you are coming up, uh, Kathy Freeman is going to share with us a little bit about how we can partner in children's ministry in this church. As Brittany was up here, she mentioned that this world is a battleground, and it is. It's a battleground on all levels for us adults and for the kids. And what I'm here about today is the Prayer Warrior Program for our village school families our village school kids. Our deacons have got little bookmarks in the back. There's, they're gonna, if you stick your hand up and you wanna be a prayer warrior for a kid at school, 
They can hand you a bookmark and on it, it's gonna have the name and the grade of a kid. Kindergarten through eighth grade, every kid is on that, in that program. And our church, this group of people, we are the patriarchs and matriarchs of that school. Those kids, about half of them are members here that you may see here. There's many of them that go to other congregations. We have a few that aren't churched. And we need a prayer warrior for each one of those kids, whether they're gonna be here or they're gonna be elsewhere today. The other day at Extended, one of the little first grader girls came running out of her classroom and she goes, Miss Kathy, I'm part of a mystery. And I'm like, what? A mystery? She got a, just a note on a piece of paper that day from her prayer warrior at Village Church. And she was thrilled. She says, it's so exciting, I'm part of the mystery. Who's my prayer warrior? I said, I don't know. She goes, I'm going to church and I'm gonna ask every single person, are you my prayer warrior? It's so cool. I love seeing that. I love them knowing that they're involved. On the back of the card, there's instructions. If you do want to just leave a little message, you're not obligated for anything other than praying for that child. But if you want to leave a message for them, you just write their name and their grade and you leave it with the secretary here or at the school. Find Denise or Todd or me or Rhonda Johnson or Wendy Baldwin. We'll make sure that that kid gets that. When you see the updates in the bulletin and there's a class picture, take a look. Then you'll see your kids in that room. One of us can try and point it out, that individual child out to you if you want to know. But like I said, the most important thing is just praying. I keep mine by my, on my mirror by my sink. When I'm brushing my teeth at night, I can pray, help him to sleep well tonight because then I know he'll have a good day the next day. So thank you, and just pray for our kids. Boys and girls, I have an exciting story to tell you about. It's a very special story. Why don't we leave that right alone? Because I have a story to share with you. Why don't you sit right on there for your brothers? There we go. Okay, now here we go. I have a story about a little girl named Samantha. Samantha is my daughter, and she's growing up so fast. But guess what? Once upon a time, she was one and a half years old. <gasps> How could that be? And you know what? Samantha loves her daddy so much, but not only that, she loves her daddy because he's a firefighter. <gasps> Look right there, you can see little Samantha holding her daddy's hand. He's a firefighter. And you know what little curious Samantha? She wanted to know what it took to be a firefighter. So she said, Daddy, what does it take to be a firefighter like you? So he brought out his big boots, and I bet you you got your boots out for the snow, didn't you? But guess what? These are special firefighter boots because they help daddy's feet so they don't get burned and get cut by the things if he goes to a fire. <gasps> so Samantha asked her daddy, Is this all I need to be a firefighter? Daddy said, nope, not just the boots. We got to put something else on. So he brought out some of his gear. He's got some suspenders and a nice thick coat that can protect him and keep him safe. So Samantha asked her daddy, is this all I need to be a firefighter? And Daddy said, no, that's not all you need. He went back and he got his big helmet and he brought it out. And he put it on her and, and she looks pretty good as a firefighter, doesn't she? 
but she still had to ask Daddy, is this all I need to be a firefighter? And Daddy said no. <gasps> but it looks like I have everything to be a firefighter. Why not? Because firefighters need Jesus. You have to have Jesus. You have to have faith being a firefighter that Jesus can help you. So every time before daddy goes to a fire call, he prays to Jesus and he has faith and trust that he will take care of him. He takes a leap of faith if he has to climb a big, big ladder up a building that Jesus will keep him safe. If he has to help somebody who's in a car accident to get out safely, he has to have faith that Jesus will take care of him. Just like you and me, we have to have Jesus in our hearts too. And guess what? Jesus loves us enough that he will take care of us. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us. Please come into our hearts today and stay. We love you so much. Take care of us. Be with the firefighters and the EMTs. Keep they, them safe too as they go out to protect us and to help save us. We love you so much and can't wait till you take us home. In your name I pray, amen. Maybe on our way back to our seats we can sing the song, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know. This morning, before we call for the worship, I, uh, Pastor uh, Hall wanted me to remind you that in your bulletin there is a card like this, and if you want to fill that out and when the offering is passed, you can place that in the plate, or if you don't have the pen, you could fill it out and hand it into the deacon's desk at the end of church service. Um, this is a call to... Um, <clears throat> worship, uh, I mean the uh, call for the offering, and uh, it's uh, the World Budget Annual Sacrifice, and um, about 30 years ago, I came from an, uh, New Jersey and uh, got to ba Michigan and at uh, Cedar Lake, and there was a gentleman there waiting for me. He wanted to hand off the job that he'd been doing for Oh, 10 plus years, I believe. His name was Dale Walters and um, got acquainted with him. He's been there. He's now an associate professor at Southern uh, Adventist University. And he tells this story. Dale Walters says, 10 plus 10. As a small child, I was taught to tithe. Tithing was never a question in my mind. My parents gave me offerings to give for Sabbath school, and I put it in the offering plate. During my academy and early college years, I was impressed that I needed to give offerings, but I wasn't sure how to go about figuring out what I would, should do. Paying my own academy and college tuition was a heavy burden, but God provided a good job and I earned enough. One year I found out that I was going to get a small raise. I thought, I'm living just fine on what I'm making now. I know what I'm going to do. I will give 2% of my gross income for offerings. I won't miss it at all. And I didn't, he says. From then on, when I got a raise, I would add a percent or two to my offerings. By the time I finished college, I was paying 10% tithe, 5% church budget, 3% world budget, and 2% conference advance. I finished college debt-free and with several thousand dollars in the bank. I have continued this plan my whole life, and even though at times money seemed tight while we raised our family, God has truly blessed just as he said he would. 
Today's offering is for the world budget and annual sacrifice. And I wanted to add to that is Pastor Hall uh, made the appeal for this, um, uh, you know, having charitable gift annuity or the uh, charitable, the will and things. My wife and I did this several years ago, and I had the same thoughts that, that you had. And that was when I was very young, like, I don't need a will. I don't have anything. <laughs> but uh, as the Lord blesses, you find that you need to do this. And, and it's been a blessing to have uh, committed to that. Will the deacons now come forward and wait on us? Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. 
You provide so much for us. And Lord, we want to return these tithes to you. We want to return these offerings to you, Lord. And we praise you in your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading, Hebrews 11, 1 to 6. Reading. Now with faith, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the, whole, that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. Let's seek the Lord on our knees. Most gracious Father, we come before your throne of grace, O Lord, creator of the heavens and the earth, of the waters and the seas, and everything that lives in it. To you, O Father, we lift our praises, our thanksgiving, our adoration. Father, search us, examine our hearts, examine our minds. Father, we desire to be in your presence. We desire to be able to meet you coming in the clouds of heaven. But we understand, O oh Lord, that without holiness, no one will be able to see you. So cleanse us, O oh Lord. Wash us. Purify us. Make us holy. And thank you, O oh Father, for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. His shed blood. For without the the shed of blood, there is no remission of sins. Thank you for the provision that you have made that we may be forgiven, O Father. Forgive us, cleanse us, and make us ready to see you. Father, hear our petition. At this moment, we desire for your Holy Spirit. For you have said, O Lord, that it is time for those who will worship to worship you in spirit and in truth. So we follow the teachings that you have given us in truth. Now, Father, we want to worship you in spirit too. And not just here, but all day today and all day, all week long, from now on. So help us, O Lord, to be moved by your Holy Spirit at all moment. For as many as are moved or led by your Spirit are the sons of God. Father, hear our petitions. You know the hearts, our thoughts, and our hearts, our petitions of our hearts. You can read them all, O Lord. We bring them before you. We pray for ourselves. We pray for our families. We pray for our friends. We pray for our community. We pray for our co-workers, our leaders, our country, our church. Oh, Father, we pray for those who are not here with us because of sickness, because they might be unbounded. 
We pray for those who are far away because they're missionaries. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you be with them. Father, we pray that you continue doing that work of transformation. We pray for those we know that are not walking with you, that you may touch them, that you may reach them, that you may convert them to, that they may experience the joy of your salvation. Father, today as you use your servant in bringing the message, we ask for transformation. May we walk out of this place knowing that we have been with you and rejoicing in your gifts. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we ask these things. Amen. And all I've built 
has crumbled. Can you see me in the shadows when all that I have left fades away? I'll find you in the ruins that remain, remain, remain. Amen. Thank you for that music. I got to hear it twice. I appreciated it both times. You know, anywhere we go in the uh, Seventh Adventist faith, it seems like there's someone there that we know or who knows someone that we know. So in the, in the Seventh Adventist family, there's only really one degree of separation because uh, we know so many people. And I know this is a risky thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway because I, inevitably I'm not seeing someone out there that I actually know. But I, I just uh, want to say another hello to my friend Ron Keller sitting back there. Uh, his parents were my church members down in Indiana when I was pastoring down there. And they introduced me to Indiana strawberry shortcake. Now, I don't know if you've ever had strawberry shortcake Indiana style, but there's really no other way to have it, I don't think. Uh, because instead of making a shortbread cake, they make crumbled up pie crust. I love that. Now you think, ooh, you know, it was delicious. Love it, right? Because your pastor's wife, Colleen, that's her grandparents, right? And uh, Pastor Ron was the pastor at Cicero when I was there in Terre Haute and Lewis, Indiana. And uh, we had a good time uh, down there. All kinds of connections. Mr. Gammon taught all of our kids at GLA. And then Pastor Ron and my son Jeremy were affiliated at Indiana Academy. And I'm sure that there are other connections out here uh, of people that I know as well. So it's just wonderful in uh, God's family to uh, be able to come together and see people that we know. It's kind of a little bit of foretaste of heaven, isn't it? Being able to see uh, all of our friends. Our subject today is leap of faith. And before we take that leap, I want to pray one more time. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I just pray now that as we open your word and consider what you have written there for us, that you would take my words and make them yours, that you would make me disappear and only let Jesus be seen. And the words that are said, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will control how they're heard and understood. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but I'm, give, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to do something. If you have ever been to Camp Asabel, I'm going to invite you to stand. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, but if you've ever been to Camp Asabel, I'm going to invite you to stand. And um, I won't make you stand too long, depending on how you answer the next questions that I, that I present to you. So if you have ever been to a place in Camp Asabel called High Adventure, then remain standing, otherwise sit down. And if you're not sure, you haven't been there, because you would know if you've been there. So now... If you have ever climbed the rock wall at High Adventure, remain standing, otherwise sit down. Okay. And now if you've ever gone off the zip line at Camp Asabel, remain standing, otherwise sit down. And here's the final one. If you've ever gone all the way on the leap of faith, remain standing, otherwise you can sit down. Aha. Uh -huh. Now I see you look around and you look up in the balcony. I think I'm the oldest one standing. <laughs> it's always the young people that have done this. All right, thank you for playing along with me. And uh, we'll have to share experiences 
of uh, this. Well, uh, so yes, I've been to uh, High Adventure. Several years ago, our youngest daughter, Chandra, was on staff at Camp Asable, and her and a young man who later became her husband were in charge of uh, High Adventure. Actually, Mike was in charge, and Chandra was working there. And so when we came up for uh, minister's meetings, she said, uh, Mom and Dad, you need to come and uh, see where it is that I, uh, that I work. And by the way, I, I bring you greetings from my wife. She would be here with me today, but our niece, um, 40 years old, is in the hospital facing her third open heart surgery. So uh, anyway, pray for her. Um, so, so we went out and uh, Chandra took us first to the uh, rock climbing wall. Now the rock climbing wall is 36 feet high and uh, you, you put a harness on and then they attach a rope for safety to you and you climb the, the wall. And uh, I used to be a, a little more athletic years ago than I am now. And um, so I asked Chandra, what's the record? <laughs> 20 seconds. So I gave that idea up and thought, let's just climb this thing. And uh, so I started up and um, everything was fine, going great. Until I got 15 feet up, I made a mistake. What'd I do? I looked down. <laughs> and uh, see, I'm not real comfortable with heights. I, I guess I'm afraid of heights. This doesn't bother me right here. But uh, 15 feet up, it looks a lot farther down than it does when you're down on the ground and you're looking up at it. And I thought, you know what? This is good enough. I'm going, to, I'm going to descend and go back down to where it's safe. Well, interesting thing about the rock climbing wall is that two people can climb at the same time. And so as I was descending on one side, my five foot tall wife was ascending on the other side and she climbed all the way to the top and rappelled down. Well, what's a man going to do? <laughs> so I mustered up all the courage that I could find and I climbed on up to the top and rappelled back down. Actually, it, it helped me a bit to see that, that she made it and, you know, could rappel down and the ropes would save her. So uh, I was able to, to make it. The next thing we did, I didn't mention this before, but the next thing we did was the swing. And with a the swing, they just uh, attach a rope to your harness and they pull you up, you know, and then they let you swing back down. It's kind of more fun than it is scary. But uh, being a gentleman, I decided to let my wife go first. And uh, <laughs> she, she was pulled up there. They didn't tell her this part, but they said, now, now she's, she's diagonal up like this. They said, now pull that rope. And she thought the rope was going to pull her up a little higher, but it was a rip cord. And so... To screams of delight, she went flying back down. So I did that. That wasn't too bad. The next thing that we went to was the zip line. Now, the zip line is a 40-foot high platform attached to this pine tree. And you climb up the, they have uh, climbing helps, but you climb up to that 40-foot platform. You get your harness attached to the zip line and you jump off and you ride it all the way to the ground. It's a little more scary than the rock climbing wall because you have to jump out into midair even though you're attached to the zip line, 40 feet up in the air. Uh, my son-in-law said that uh, some people have to be pushed off the platform because they're afraid. And that may seem cruel, but, but it's unsafe to climb back down. They won't let you climb back down. So again, I'm the consummate gentleman and I let my wife go first. And uh, she made it. And so, I thought, well, I can make it too, I guess. And so, went on the zip line. The next thing we went to was that leap of faith. It's a 26 foot tall telephone pole with little U-bolt things stuck in the side so that you can climb. This time I decided I should be a man and uh, I went first. I didn't have the luxury this time of seeing that someone else uh, could do this and survive. And so I had to really take a leap of faith. And so I climbed to the top of the pole. Everything was fine. Uh, while I had two hands and two feet uh, attached to the pole. But as you can see, this uh, young girl, and she's going to stand up in a minute, although I don't have a picture of it. When you get to the top of the pole, 
you have to stand there and, and release all support. And then you jump out into midair and the ropes catch you. Well, I'm sure I stood there for at least five minutes trying to get up the courage to jump. And the only reason I finally jumped was that I was too afraid to climb back down because how are you going to get back down when you're standing on the pole and you have to reach down with nothing to hang on to? So I jumped in and I made it. But I couldn't help but think how this leap of faith at Camp Asabo is very similar to the faith that we need to exercise in our own lives when it comes to the things that God asks us to do as Christians. What is faith, anyway? Uh, Webster describes it this way, faith is unquestioning belief that does not require proof or evidence. So, for example, some of you may have heard that I was coming to speak with you today. And you would have had to believe by faith that I would actually show up. And believe me, it was by faith that I showed up today. If you think the weather is bad here, you should have seen it in Lansing when I left at 6 o'clock this morning and uh, barely made it on time, even though I thought I was allowing a half an hour extra time. It was pretty bad. So by faith, God got me here. But now that I am here speaking with you, faith is no longer relevant you don't have to exercise faith that I'm going to come and speak with you because I'm here speaking with you. So faith involves something that you really can't hold on to yet in a tangible way. It involves belief that you really don't have actual proof for. Secondary uh, definition of faith is that it is complete trust or confidence or reliance. And that's the kind of faith that we have when it comes to our relationship or experience with God. We have complete trust or confidence or reliance on Him. In our scripture, we read that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So even though you can't hold something in your hand, faith is that substance. And even though you can't see something, faith allows you to see it, as it were, and uh, believe that it is actually real when you can't touch it or see it. The uh, Andrews Study Bible says it this way, faith is the assurance or confidence that God will fulfill his promises. So do you agree with that definition? F faith is assurance or confidence that God will fulfill his promises. Will he actually fulfill them? I'd like to spend the next few moments considering with you what you believe and what you have faith in. Not everything but some key things that we as Seventh-day Adventists probably can all agree that we have faith in or that we believe in them. For instance, do you believe that Jesus will come again? Amen. Amen. After all, you are right now at the Berrien Springs Village Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we know that Advent uh, means the coming of Jesus and we're looking for his second Advent or his second coming. We believe that he will come again. In fact, John 14, 1 to 3, the last uh, night there that Jesus was able to spend with his disciples, he was trying to encourage them for the times that would, uh, would be coming into their lives. And so he said these words uh, of assurance. And, and, and say it with me if you know this, uh, this uh, passage. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Say it with me. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We believe that, don't we? In fact, believing in Jesus coming again is more foundational to Seventh-day Adventism than the Sabbath is. Now, I don't mean the Sabbath isn't important. It's very important. We know that it's going to be a very big thing in the end times. But our forefathers were Adventists before they were Seventh-day Adventists. It wasn't until years later that they learned about the Sabbath. They believed Jesus was coming again, and that's really what started to bring them together. So we believe that, and we have believed it for a long time. How about this one? Do you believe that Jesus can raise the dead? In John 11, verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He was talking to Martha. It's the story of Lazarus, his friend who had died. Lazarus got sick, and Mary and Martha sent for Jesus, and they said, come quickly, because uh, your friend Lazarus is sick. They knew that if Jesus would come, everything would be fine, because people lived where Jesus was. They didn't die. Jesus didn't go. Lazarus died. Four days later, Jesus made it to town. Lazarus had been dead for four days. Martha said, Lord, if if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, well, I know that he will rise in the resurrection. Jesus said, no, I am the resurrection and the life. Though he were dead, yet he will live. And we know that he raised him to life, even though he had been dead for four days. And the evidence of that is that the sister said, well, well, don't go to the tomb. He will stink. His body has started to uh, decompose. He had been dead uh, that long. Now, we believe that Jesus can raise the dead, don't we? And yet, I dare say that none of us here in this room have seen anyone raised to, the, raised to life who had been dead for four days or more. Now, we may have seen people come back after being down a few minutes. I shared this morning that uh, my brother-in-law, Kurt, 49 years old and in better shape than I've ever been in, went down with a heart attack. He was out 12 minutes before they uh, revived him. And for uh, several days, we sat by his bedside in CCU, wondering if he would wake up. The EEG was was pretty much flat, and the doctors really didn't give much hope that he would come back. But he did, and he is. And uh, I don't know if he's preaching uh, today or not, But God has restored him to health, and and, uh, he's living and working for God still to this day. We've seen those kinds of things happen, but we probably haven't seen this kind of thing, and yet we believe that Jesus can raise the dead, don't we? Even if they've been dead for four days or four years or 40 years. And we believe that simply because God said it. We take his word for it. How about that Jesus' blood can cover your sins? 1 John 1, 7 says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe that, don't we? Do you believe that? Now, this one's a little bit more tricky because to say that we haven't experienced that, you could argue with me pretty strong on that. Because when we come to Jesus through his drawing of us to come to him, And we come to him in repentance, he forgives us, and part of that is a changed life. If if you don't have a changed life after coming to Jesus, there's, there's more coming that needs to be involved there. So perhaps we have experienced somewhat of the cleansing of Jesus' blood in our lives. I hope that we have. But there's a part of this experience that we have not experienced yet, and that is standing in the judgment and meeting the the tribunal of God and having Jesus say, there's no record against him. His record is clean. That part we haven't experienced yet, but we believe by faith that Jesus will do that for us, don't we? We do. How about this one? If you would open your Bibles and uh, look at this scripture with me, Malachi chapter 3. And we'll begin with verse 6. Now, I understand service is supposed to end around quarter to one. Is that right? Sometime between one and a quarter to one? We're, we're, we're going we're to beat one o'clock. Let's, let's just say that. <laughs> All right, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. The prophet is quoting God here. He says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Now let's stop there and analyze this a little bit. God says that he does not change. I'm glad for that because if God changed his mind on us, he'd probably be fed up and and just wipe us all out. But he says, I don't. And so I haven't consumed you. Why? Because we have changed. God's people have gone away from his ordinances. But they said, 
how shall we return? In other words, how have we gone away from you, God? I'm not aware of, of going away from you. So God answers the question, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, please don't jump to the conclusion that one of the stewardship guys from the conference has come and he's going to now beat you up about tithes and offerings. Please don't close your ears because it's the next verse that we really want to get to. But we've got to go through these verses to appreciate the next verse. So notice that it says, God said, will a man rob God? Now I'm thinking that no one has a version of the Bible here today that says, will a man embezzle from God? Now you know about embezzling. Embezzling is something that people do. I don't know how they do it, but somehow they're able to, to change figures around in the accounting books and uh, take money that, that uh, appears after they're done that was never there. So no one's supposed to find that out unless you're a really good auditor and you can figure it out. So they've embezzled the money. Nobody gets hurt. Nobody even knows that it's gone. And they have it. It doesn't say that. Do you have a version of the Bible that says, will a man burglarize God? I haven't seen one of those versions either. Because burglary, a burglary, burglar generally wants to get in and out when nobody will know. The goal is not to confront anybody, but it's to go in and grab what you want, get out, and, and nobody knows and nobody sees. That's the object of a burglar. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, will a man rob God? Now, robbery is bold, gun in the face, give me all your money kind of thing. That's what robbery is. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I feel like it's a pretty big, solid limb, and I don't think I have much chance of falling off of it or it breaking. Even though I don't know very many of you, I'm going to venture to say that I highly doubt that there's anyone here today that would take a gun or a weapon over to the local bank, put it in the face of the teller, and say, give me all your money. I don't think there's anybody here that would do that. Probably not. And yet, there could be someone here today that is actually doing that to God by withholding his tithe and being unwilling to give free will offerings. Well, I say this because I want to get to verse 10 because I'm not here to beat you up over those things if you're unfaithful in tithe and unwilling to give God offerings, but because if you are in that situation, you're missing a wonderful blessing that God is wanting to give to you. But it takes faith to get it. Notice verse 10 then. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me or test me or prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. That's what God wants to do for you, but you have to be faithful to him. And so it may require a little bit of a leap of faith to do that because you might be saying, you know what? When I get down to the end of the month, there isn't any money left. And now you're asking me to give an extra tenth of my income to God. Or if you're already doing that, give more offering to God. I don't have it. It's not there. I'm not promising you anything. But God is. He says, if you will be faithful to me in tithes and offerings, give me a chance to be faithful to you and give you more than you need. Now, if you do that and God gives you more than you need, what do you do with the extra? Buy more stocks, buy more mutual funds? I heard the answer over here. <laughs> Jesus told a parable in the New Testament about a man that had that situation. He was blessed beyond all imagination. As far as we know, according to the parable, he, he got it honestly. He didn't defraud anybody. And he had so much, he said, I'm going to build bigger barns. And then I'm going to sit back and take it easy. And how many days and how many years did he get to do that? None. None. Because the Bible says this night your soul will be required of you. He didn't even get to build the bigger barns. He didn't get to enjoy it. 
So yes, God expects you to share the extra that, that he uh, gives to you. Maybe you want to or are already helping the people in El Salvador. It's a wonderful thing. So God wants to bless you in a special way. So we talked about believing that Jesus is coming again, and we believe that solely on, on the fact that God said so, right? We have no other evidence. We believe that Jesus can raise the dead, and we believe that simply because God said so. And we believe that he will cover our sins in the judgment, and we believe that just because God said so. We take him at his word. And yet this promise that he makes about pouring out more blessing than we can receive, sometimes it seems like we have a harder time believing that one, even though there are thousands of stories, modern-day evidence, proving that God has and is doing that very thing. Now, I don't like to read from the pulpit, but in order to convey the, the impact of this story, I'm going to have to read it to you. It's not very long, and it's from a book called Over and Over Again, Volume 2. I forgot to mention this in first service, and so it's to your benefit. But uh, this book is out of print. Actually, it's printed at uh, University Press. Ron Knott uh, is the editor. And, um, but it's out of print, and, and we were able at the Michigan Conference to get a whole bunch of them somehow. And so we have them, and we're passing them out as we go visit uh, different churches. But of course, we don't have enough for one for each one of you. The ones that I brought, maybe a dozen or so, are at the deacon's um, counter. But here's the deal. You can have one. You don't have to pay for it. But there's a catch involved. You have to read it and then share it with someone else. Is that fair? <laughs> and uh, you'll be able to benefit from the story. So this story, the first story in the book, is written by uh, Elder Walter Wright, the late Elder Walter Wright, former president of our Lake Union Conference. And this story he shares happened many, many years ago and before he himself was actually a pastor. So I'm going to share the story with you as we come down to close. Many years ago, I was one of those pitiful creatures who thought that if I put $3 in the offering plate each Sabbath, I had done my duty. After all, if every member gave as much as I, the church would have a tidy sum to manage. It never occurred to me that I was partly responsible for creating the church operating deficit, which was reported each month by the church treasurer. Apparently, everyone was, not, everyone was not contributing as much as I. Our church held a stewardship emphasis weekend conducted by the conference stewardship director. When my turn came for my personal interview with him, they used to do that back in the day. The uh, stewardship director would come and he would visit with each one of you and... Uh, go over what should be your portion. We don't do that anymore. When my turn came for my personal interview with him, I was horrified and incredulous when he described a formula that showed I should be contributing $45 per month for church operating. He said this was many years ago and did not include my tithe, which I faithfully returned. That amount, $45, was nearly four times as much as I was presently doing. I didn't see how such a thing could be possible but he convinced me to trust God and make him my partner as I stepped out in faith. Now I had a place for that $45 and it was not for church expense. It was wintertime in southwestern Ohio. Our heating oil tank was almost empty and I needed that $45 to buy more oil to keep my little family warm and snug from the blustery weather. However, from that Friday's paycheck, I deducted $45 to place in my offering envelope for Sabbath morning. My wife and I decided we would trust God at least a little. If he didn't come through for us before the oil tank ran dry, we could always go to my parents for the weekend to keep warm. That Friday evening, we opened the Sabbath in worship, and then I used the dipstick to check the oil tank just outside the kitchen door. Now, especially for the young people here today, you're probably thinking, what are you talking about? Well, back when... Uh, when you lived out in the country, you had fuel oil furnace. I don't know if any, does anybody have a fuel oil furnace anymore? I don't know. Some people do, okay. And you had a big tank that they put fuel oil in, and most of those tanks uh, didn't have a gauge on it to tell you when it was empty. You had to take a stick that had inches on it, like a yardstick, only it's a lot longer than that, and put it down in, and however many inches you had told you how long it's going to last. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. So... He said, uh, the level read three inches 
or about five gallons for that size tank. I hoped it would get us through until morning. The old furnace rumbled and blew all night. It was a very cold night outside, and on Sabbath morning, I noticed that the outside of the windows on our house were covered with ice. Just before leaving for Sabbath school, I checked the oil tank again. It showed, what? Three inches, or about five gallons. Oh, I lost my place. There we are. <laughs> this is strange business, I said to myself. We sure are lucky. And then he says, isn't it amazing how long it sometimes takes us to recognize God's working? I was nervous all through church that day, especially when I put my envelope in the offering plate. We rushed home, gathered our food, and prepared to hurry to my parents' home for warmth and shelter. The house was still warm as we loaded up the car, so I decided to check the tank one last time to get an idea of when it would finally run out. It showed three inches, or about five gallons. Now, even I am not so stupid as to miss completely a miracle of God when it slams me in the face. The furnace grumbled and rumbled all Saturday night. Early Sunday morning, I grabbed that dipstick to see what God had done. Yes, indeed, three inches, or about five gallons. By now, I was so confident that God was proving himself that I relaxed and watched a football game on TV. I'm not advocating that, but it's part of the story. My favorite team, the Cleveland Browns, beat the Chicago Bears, and I was warm and comfortable while they did it. Monday, I received a small check, and it was more than enough to fill the oil tank. When the oil man came after my urgent call for a delivery, I yelled a greeting to him and asked him to hurry with a fill-up. He ran the dipstick into the tank and exclaimed, What's the hurry? You still have three inches, or about five gallons. Amen. What God can do. So faith in anything is increased as you prove that what you have faith in is reliable. You see, until I jumped off the top of that leap of faith pole, I couldn't know whether or not the ropes would catch me. It was only after I took the leap of faith that I knew they would. It works the same with God. You have to take a leap of faith to know that he will be with you. One last 60-second story as we close. There's a young pastor, it was not me, there's a young pastor raising three children on a, a starting pastor's salary. And each month, there was no money left in the, in the checkbook. Uh, he was faithful in, in his tithe, and he gave 1% offering. It's all he felt he could afford. After all, there's no money left at the end of the month after he pays the bills. But he felt convicted in his devotional life that he needed to give more to God in offerings. And so through prayer, he made a covenant with God that he would increase his offering to 10% to match his tithe, and he would do that in increments of 1% each month. So the first month, he put that 2% in the offering, and they made it through the month. There's a little money left. The next month, 3%, then 4%, then 5%, each month until he hit the 10% in offering. Believe it or not, when he reached the level of 10% offering, he said there was more money left in the checkbook at the end of the month than there had ever been before. Now, math was one of my best subjects in school. I'm not an accountant. But that kind of accounting really doesn't wash in today's society to give away and actually have more in the end. But it does in God's accounting, doesn't it? I don't know how it works. I really don't. It just does. Why? Because God said it would, and he is faithful in his promises. I used to think that people who withheld tithe from God and who were not faithful in giving offerings were like that because they were greedy. They wanted to keep it all for themselves. Maybe that's true or partly true. But after studying this passage, 
I recognize that there's something else going on as well. It's really a matter of lack of faith and trusting God because even the greedy guy looking at this promise and believing it would give the money to God so he can get some back. That's not why we do it. But God has promised that if we do, he will give back to us. So I want to challenge you, if you've struggled with being faithful to God in tithe, recognize that he wants to bless you. You're holding God back. And also recognize that God wants to challenge you to trust him in giving offerings to him. You don't, you don't have to give all your income, but trust him in what you give and watch how he will work and will take care of you even more than you actually need. So let's trust God. What do you say? Yeah. Sing with me our closing hymn, number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Heavenly Father, thank you for being faithful to us. I pray that each one of us here will be inspired by your Holy Spirit to have faith, to be faithful to you, not just in our finances, but in every area of our lives. Help us to trust you because we can believe your word. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.